Hey, good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth edition of the Bunch Lectures about Computational Type, uh, hosted by the Future Sketches Group at the, the MIT Media Lab. So happy you're here and uh, welcome. Um, if you haven't yet uh, posted in the chat where you're joining from, I already saw there's people from all over the world joining, which is really, really cool. Um, and so we'll start today's uh, lecture. Um, there will still be people joining me later maybe, but uh, we want to start just with some announcements. So first of all, thank you. Thank you for joining. And also uh, thanks for the MIT Media Lab and uh, Zach Lieberman, who is my PI for uh, organizing this. Um, and also a big shout out to Blair Fell, who is doing the ASL interpretation. So if you are interested in that, you can find him in the Zoom. Uh, participants and pin his uh, screen. So yeah, thank you for uh, being here. Um, and today, so this is the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, episode, basically, or the fourth lecture in a series. Um, and we're super happy to have Peter Cho with us today. Um, we've already heard from Space Types, Bio, Yasmin Abbasan, and Talia Cotton. And next week we'll hear from the Beatrice Dortano and then the, the week after from Dia Studio. Uh, so yeah, we're very excited about that. Uh, two announcements before we go continue to the, the uh, lecture. So first of all, uh, there's an open call for um, a position uh, of transformative design. So a tenure track position at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, we'll post the link in the chat, uh, and if you're interested, or if you know anyone that might be interested, uh, yeah, please apply. Uh, we're looking for people that are uh, not directly in our bubble, so uh, yeah, feel please please try to apply or or send it to people that might. Uh, and then secondly, um, so the Future Sketches group uh, that I'm part of um, uh, at the MIT Media Lab is. Um, taking accepting new students this year. Uh, so we have um, uh, we have an open house that from the MIT Media Lab, but we also have an in information hour on Wednesday, October 4th. So next Wednesday from 10 to 11. Um, so we'll post in a form that you can fill in if you're interested in that. Uh, and then we're happy to answer any questions you might have and talk a bit more about the program. Um, so. Uh, anyway, we're here today uh, to hear about Peter Cho, uh, who is, uh, in my opinion, a legend and maybe sort of started this field of computational type. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, if you don't know him yet, so he's a designer now, uh, who basically um, yeah, works uh, as a design leader in Oakland, California, and um, he has a, he works at the company called Brilliant.org, which is like a learning a platform for STEM. Um, and yeah, he basically works really on this intersection between design and technology. So he has a MFA degree from the UCLA Design Media Arts Department, but he also actually went to the MIT Media Lab um, uh, uh, um, and made letterscapes there. Um, yeah, and so he does many other projects that are also interesting. And we're just really happy to have him today. So please, uh, give a warm applause to Peter, um, and I'm very curious to hear. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I will endeavor to share my screen correctly. All right, is that showing up? Okay, wonderful. Um, first off, I want to say a huge thanks to Vera and Zach and the future sketches sketches team. Thanks for the invitation to speak. I'm really excited. Um, I have to say like computational typography, I kind of feel like this lecture series was designed for me. Um, I have been coming to the talks. I really enjoyed them. And um, I feel very grateful to be included in the company here. Um, and uh, so you can, it's all about the gram. I'll mention that you can find me as P Chocho on Instagram and also my fledgling type studio, which is typo topo. Uh, I thought a lot about what I could present today and I decided to first take take you all through a personal history of some of the places and things I've done um, sort of chrono chronologically and then 
uh, talk through a few themes of what interests me when it comes to letters and typography and type and computational media. So my love for fonts started from a really early age and I traced it back to my first computer, which was a computer like this. Um, I loved playing around with Mac Paint and HyperCard and software on the Mac, early Mac. Um, I learned about desktop publishing um, and I would make zines and newsletters in PageMaker, print them out on my image writer, uh, dot matrix printer. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, I would also go to the local newsstand um, downtown and I would check out magazines on like desktop publishing and graphic design. And I discovered this magazine, which is called Colors, uh, had really bold typography and photo editorials, um, art directed by Tibor Kalman. I was really drawn to to this. I didn't, I didn't quite know why. Um, as a high school student, I also subscribed to this large scale print magazine. It was called Font and Function. Uh, and Adobe used to publish this uh, every quarter. It was their type catalog. Um, and I would study the fonts in the library. Um, I even begged my parents to help me buy fonts, which came on three and a half inch diskettes. Um, I would use them in my little projects. Uh, I also loved this stuff, which was letter set transfer lettering. Um, and as a high school student, I like collected these and would like play with them in my spare time. Um, so I went to college, I went to MIT um, and I studied engineering. Um, and as a, I think a junior in college, I got the opportunity to learn about the visible language workshop, which was at the media lab. Um, and I got to see Mariel Cooper, um, the woman in the upper left uh, before she passed away. She headed the group at the Media Lab um, VLW, and she gave a lecture about something that she called information landscapes. And she presented all this work about how you could present hierarchies of information in these abstract virtual 3D spaces that you could zoom in and out of. And I just, I was, my, my mind was really blown. Um, and then as a senior in college, I met John Maida, he was starting as a professor at the Media Lab, um, and I was really astounded to see his work, uh, like this work, this project called the Reactive Square, which was a black square on the Mac screen um, that could react to microphone input in 10 different ways. Uh, and it was abstract and really beautiful, and I, I didn't know what this was. Um, this was actually before the idea of creative coding. We hadn't had that term yet. Uh, and John was pushing for this idea that people who had skills in coding as well as an aesthetic sensibility, uh, they could make new and unique things that um, say a, a programmer and a designer working side by side wouldn't come up with. Uh, so I ended up uh, staying at the Media Lab uh, for a master's program and I joined John Maida's group. It was called Aesthetics and Computation. And I focused on making different things with type um, and code. Um, and this was one project I made where John had sent me a cryptic feedback message about work I had been doing. And I took his message and animated it in 3D space. So he told me to stop thinking so flat. He said to try to move into space again. Voronoi was good experiment. Do not focus on center object. Think environment, space, architecture. Um, and as a student, I also made a project, this project, which was called Alphabet Zoo, where each letter of the alphabet was in this um, kind of storybook. You could tap on each of the letters and they each had this um, three-dimensional shell-like form and a personality that would come to life through animation. So M is dancing. See is winking. Okay. 
to use like a window shade. And then N is just tired. All right, so after the Media Lab, um, I went to work for a company called Imaginary Forces in LA, and they're known for motion graphics. One of our clients was IBM, and I worked on a, a project where we were um, helping develop branding and motion for a network of centers for e-business innovation that IBM was opening up. Um, there was this typeface that one of my colleagues, Jens Gelhar, created, and it was based on the IBM logo, the bars and the IBM logo. And I created an animation using this typeface and writing these, uh, writing this animation in C++ and OpenGL. Um, this is a, about 60 seconds. It ran as a TV commercial, and it features a series of questions that are meant to get you thinking about your business and IBM in a different way. After a few years working in different media, like motion, uh, exhibit design, branding, and the web, I went back to school at UCLA, where I, I did an MFA program in media art. So here are some projects on the screen that I made that were media art installations, and they focused on, on language and, um, and different ways to create things through motion and interaction. Um, post UCLA, I spent a few years teaching some design classes in LA. Then I moved to the Bay Area, where I live now, and I started working in-house as a product designer and leading design teams. So here's some um, places I've worked. So I worked at a few different tech companies in the publishing space, where I got to work on layout and design problems, um, working with type. Uh, I started uh, I started up at a, a company called Inkling. Uh, where I led a team working on bringing textbooks to the iPad. Uh, I worked at Medium, which is a publishing platform for writers and readers. Um, I worked on writer tools and the partner program, um, and I designed different features for authors and for readers. Uh, I led design at Pocket, which is an article saving and recommendation service, um, and I led the team through a redesign and developing some new features for audio and for curation. And uh, currently for the past two years, I've been leading the design team at Brilliant. Uh, we're an app for learning math and data, programming and science through interactivity and storytelling um, for adults who are looking to level up in their career and their knowledge of um, math and science um, and for students as well. Um, and it's been a blast working on tools. Uh, this is really fun um, and interactive learning. Uh, the team has a lot of depth and we've been doing a lot of cool things. Um, so on the side, uh, in 2017, I decided to go to type school. So learning how to make type. Um, and I did this in nights and weekends. And uh, so it's part of the Type at Cooper West extended program, which is now called Type West. And I spent a year learning the ins and outs of type design and history, um, theory, and practice uh, with this group of lovely folks. I um, started out 
in the class, we would learn about calligraphy. So we were doing a lot of um, like making large scale uh, calligraphy uh, and learning different models for calligraphy. Uh, we also did a lot of what we call type cookers. So this is a game where you're given a set of randomized parameters, um, a type menu. Um, you can see example on the left. And that's what your type is supposed to look like. So you're asked to draw a word um, and then you are doing this as a class. So you look at them all together and with your classmates, you get to critique the work and um, the teachers maybe uh, give you uh, uh, a lot of education on contrast, like where thins and thicks are supposed to go in letters, um, looking at spacing uh, and negative and positive space, how different uh, letter shapes are formed and things like where stairs typically go. When I decided to apply to type school, I was honestly worried that working in font software and moving points around the screen would feel tedious and that this thing that I loved, which was type, would become tiresome. Um, but thankfully for me, I found that the act of designing type and working through the points and paths and spacing is like super fun. Um, they talk about the fun scale and it's seriously type one fun for me. So it's really fun while I'm in the act of doing it. And I, I keep wanting to come back to, to do more. Um, in type school, the first project was a revival. So this was my first semester's project um, from a few years back. Um, and this year I've gotten more serious about type design. Um, and I launched a type foundry in July. Uh, it's called Typo Topo and PZ is my first font release. It's a humanist sans serif and um, I'm using it throughout this presentation. Uh, I also have a, a few more typefaces in the works. So Arlito is a high contrast serif face inspired by show card writing of the 1910s. Um, and Convo is a Kirby stencil meant to be used in multicolor applications. So if you wanna check out the site, it's typotopo.com or you could sign up for my newsletter there. Um, so since learning type design, I've been also working on ways to combine my new type knowledge with creative coding. So here's one example. Um, back in type school, we did a workshop on scripts with Richard Lipton. And I came up with this idea for a script that had like an inline treatment. Um, and I took those sketches and later worked on making it digital and coming up with a way that I could then animate it programmatically. So here's an animated letter N using this type design. And here's an animation of a word using this type design. All right. Um, okay, so I want to talk about some themes too. And um, first, I wanted to zoom way out, which is why do we like letters? Like, why are we so fascinated by letters? Um, and I, I feel like letters have kind of a talisman-like quality. They're connected to childhood. You have these brightly colored bl blocks and magnets. Uh, you learn your letters. You learn how to read and write them over a really formative period of your development. And then letters are something that are ingrained at a really early age when you're so impressionable. And then you can string letters together into words and then to sentences, paragraphs. Letters, they contain a whole universe of language. You can express ideas and you can tell stories. It's kind of magic. You can broadcast your words out to many people through writing technologies uh, like the book. Um, or the web. Um, and here's a quote from Ellen Lepton's book, Thinking with Type. Um, typography is usually invisible, but the choice of typeface also conveys another layer of meaning that a reader may or may not notice. It's a vibe or it's a feeling that's put on top of the letters. And the typeface can evoke an emotion um, in, in your reader as well. We like letters because they contain many different shapes and they can come in many different sizes and styles. Uh, they can they come from this long tradition of writing and they tie us back to history. There are so many different types of scripts. And as we get better at seeing letters, we can 
start to understand and recognize how the same letter can be expressed with a wide range of shapes. Like all of these are easily recognizable as the same letter A. Um, but there are also some rules to how this can work. There are two main lowercase Roman A shapes, uh, the single story A on the left and the double story A on the right. Uh, and maybe you could see that they're connected in this way with these intermediate shapes. But if you pull out just these intermediate shapes, it's rare that you would ever be able to say that these shapes in isolation are an A, like maybe they look more like a D. So how do we think about the alphabet as a design system? Um, I want to talk a little bit about the alphabet, um, A to Z in English, and how I think about it as someone who designs letters. Um, I found this uh, XKCD comic that deeply resonated with me. Uh, I love how he says that uh, the, the letters start out strong um, and then the dotted letters I and J are next to each other, they're friends. And then V through Z are haunted letters and I'm 100% on that. Uh, so here's the lowercase a through z in PZ, the typeface I designed. And um, when you are designing a typeface, you'll start with some idea, some inspiration for your letter forms. Um, the lowercase a through z is where you start because these are the characters that get used the most in, um, in, in um, graphic design and, and layout and typography. Um, you'll often start out with N and O as control characters because they define the size of your letters overall and the default spacing. Um, here's a handful of the letters that um, I will start with. Uh, they spell out this word hamburger font, which is not a real word, but it's a, like a string that you can use to start designing these shapes and, um, and then apply them to the rest of the, the characters. A bunch of the round shapes are all related to each other um, often. So the B, D, P, and Q in lowercase letters are often designed so that the bowls match each other and are just, you know, um, 180 degrees off from each other. Uh, and then these letters all relate well too. Uh, it can often be straightforward how you design them. These are all your diagonals. So K shows up midway, which is really weird. And then V through Z, these are often your problem children. Uh, it's hard to get the weight and the proportions of these letters to match the straights and rounds of the others. And then this one is often a pain and hard to get right. Um, so you start with A through Z and then you add more characters and you can express more things. So punctuation lets you convey different emotions and asides and emphasis. Diacritic marks or accents, they're important, especially for writing in, in languages other than English numbers and symbols, they all have different meanings that can help you expand what you can say with your type. Um, the goal in type design is a paradox because you want to make the letters as uniform and unified as possible, but you also want to make them as distinct from each other as possible. So you're trying to make each letter the closest to the platonic idea of what that letter looks like, but you're following the overall structure and rules that you've come up for your typeface while keeping in mind the history of type and how the long tradition of type um, has evolved over time and different type conventions that we've all come to understand. A lot of designers throughout history have tried to rationalize the alphabet in different ways. So I want to show just a few examples. Uh, the German painter and printmaker Albrecht Dürer, 1535, he published a treatise on the just shaping of letters. So this book had step-by-step -step instructions on how you're supposed to construct letters correctly using strict geometries. As part of the Bauhaus movement, um, the Austrian American graphic artist, painter, um, and architect Herbert Beyer, he had a proposal for a universal type in 1925 that combined upper and lowercase letters into a single alphabet. And then Josef Albers, who, which, who was one of his contemporaries, he explored ways to rationalize the alphabet into letters made from modular geometric forms. Um, and then here's an example from the US, uh, American graphic designer Bradbury Thompson in 1950 published something called Alphabet 26, which was also 
a unicase um, alphabet. Um, and he designed this after seeing how his son struggled to learn upper and lowercase letters. Um, so all of these rationalized alphabets from history, they had different goals. They were trying to improve written communication. Um, they had an idea about efficiency or an aesthetic idea. But in digital media, rationalizing the alphabet can mean coming up with flexible systems and rules for how you design each of the letters so that you can manipulate those forms in interesting ways, um, adding animation or interactivity or transitions between letter forms. And you're able to make something that's expressive, unique, and beautiful. Uh, so when it comes to underlying computational models for how we render letters to the screen, there are some different um, examples or options out there. Uh, so A, this is a tradi the traditional way that we represent fonts. It's through outlined Bezier curves. Um, each glyph of a letter, uh, of a font, is um, an enclosed Bezier path that describes the positive shapes with a counterclockwise path and the negative shapes or holes with a clockwise path. So it allows for a lot of control over what kind of shape you can produce. Um, it's also worth mentioning that Bezier curves are not always exact. So you can't actually represent a circle with a Bezier curve. It's just a very, very close approximation. And then there's some other examples of how you could make the, the letter forms that are modular in digital media. You can make a matrix and turn on or off shapes to make uh, each glyph. Um, and so this could be like a dot matrix or a segmented display. You could define each letter as a few shapes that have parameters assigned to them, like X and Y, width and height, the corner roundness, angle start and stop. And then these parameterized shapes can define the positive or the negative shapes of each letter. And then um, this is maybe a little advanced, but letters come from writing with the hand. Um, so it might make sense to represent letters as a path um, of a, pe a pen or a brush. And in this model, you'd have like a skeleton path for the letter and then parameters like the pen angle or width or shape applied to the path. Uh, Donald Knuth's Metafont, uh, the text rendering used in LaTeX was used a model like this. Uh, and then there's a Dutch design firm called Underwear and they're doing really cool work using a model like this for a handwriting font called Scribo. And then here's some bonus ideas from computational media. Um, in computer graphics, there's a technique called metaballs or blobs or isosurfaces, and they can be 2D or 3D. Um, the Alphabet Zoo project used with the shell-like letters, um, they use this concept, the metaballs. Um, and there's something called Voronoi, which was mentioned earlier. It's a, in mathematics, it's di dividing a plane into regions um, and showing the lines where um, the, uh, where points are closest to each other inside of those um, regions. Um, so if you apply the, the points of a path, um, like a tight path to a Voronoi diagram, you could get some interesting effects. Um, and then any of these ideas could also be applied to the third dimension too. Okay, so you have all these different ways you could model letters computationally. Um, so with that in mind, um, I want to show you a few more projects that feature letters. Uh, so here's a project I made. Um, it was uh, Type Me, Type Me Not. Um, and I'm going to switch to the other screen. So this came out of a, a class that John Maida taught in uh, computational typography in um, 1997. Uh, so I made this piece where there are three different kinds of alphabets and three modes. So if you, um, let's see, is this still showing up? Just want to make sure. Okay. Um, so here you have each of the letters of the alphabet are created with these pie-like shapes and they transition from letter to letter. Uh, so I could MIT so type photography.
Um, and then for me, like, it's really fun to see how some of these letters transform from one to another. Like the transitions between the letters are just really interesting to watch and to play with. Um, the second mode presents oh. each of the letters with the sound that the letter makes for the consonant. So, mm. And then the, the type of mm. animation that appears mm. is different depending on what kind of consonant it is. So the um, explosive consonants appear this way. And then the third one is a, a, a matrix. So you can type letters into the matrix, letter A, letter B. If I type A again, I get B back. So it's a, it becomes kind of a memory of all the letters that I've typed into it. Okay, so that was type me, type me not. Um, I want to take you through a project called Letterscapes. Uh, so this was a piece where A through Z um, are each interactive landscapes. Uh, let me switch over to that. Uh, this is a pretty old project. So I've been, I found that the way I can play it is if I play it locally and then use this applet runner. So the, this came out of a prompt that John Maida asked, which was, how would you play a letter and play a letter in the way that you might play a musical instrument? This was my response to trying to do that with the letter A. I'll take you through some of these. So each of these is a different, uh, a different idea around how you might play with that letter in an interactive way. This place with kind of a 2D and 3D idea. This letter K was used in processing. So folks who may may have seen this as part of one of the examples in the processing uh, library. Let's see, skip ahead to S. Letter B. So switching back. Um, here's a more recent project. Um, I was interested in this these blocky letter forms where the counter spaces become the primary shapes that define the letters. 
And let me show a few things I did with this. So uh, this is A through Z in this typeface where you can see the counter shapes like slide in and out to make each letter. So that's A through Z there. Um, and then here's a different sketch where I let I made it interactive. So as you type, you can transition from letter to letter. Um, I mentioned that uh, B, P, D, and Q are often related to each other. And this, I just made them all the same. Um, and I think this is like in the pie, pie shape letters from type me, type me not. It's fun to play and see what different transitions you can come up with. X, P, W, M, X, T. Uh, right, so that's that project. Um, and then I want to show and talk a little bit about letters themselves. They're beautiful objects, um, but really letters are meant to be seen and used in the context of words to convey meaning. Um, one of my type teachers from the type program, he hated how in type specimens, you'll see a gorgeous like lowercase g blown up um, or a big ampersand, um, really big. But we're kind of fetishizing these single characters when they're meant to be used in writing uh, in the context of words. So here's one project I did called Wordscapes, where similar to um, the A through Z of the letterscapes, uh, I made them into single um, interactive words. So I'll play that here. Okay, so each of the letters of the alphabet represents a different word and it's a interactive with the mouse pointer. Word aloft. And a bit drowsy. Elude. I think of these as, as kind of single word interactive poems. This is one of my favorites.
this is uh very gross to me. <laughs> I have a fondness for this one. All right, a couple more. This is me too much of the time. All right. Um, okay, so just, uh, Couple more things. Um, yeah, this is the last thing I want to show. It's just a, a small sketch that I made uh, a couple years back for the new year. So this is the the phrase "new year" spelled out with this ribbon-like form for each of the letters. And then I use this to spell out this uh, short phrase. Um, all right, so hopefully this presentation gave you a sense of how I think about letters, typography, and type in computational media. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, everyone give a big applause to Peter. Wow, that was so interesting and so informative. Thank you so much. Um, there's a, yeah, it was really great. And also thank you for doing live demos, that's always uh, scary, but it went really well. Um, so there were already some uh, questions posted in the chat, but if you have more questions, uh, please post them. Um, there were a lot of uh, questions about the way, like the language you use. Uh, so Amri, for instance, asked uh, if uh, if you work with After Effects. Um, but but Antonina asked if uh, the project, I think that was the project Letterscapes, if you wrote that in C++. So could you talk a bit about the tools you use to make your work? Yeah, um, I, uh, so I, the Letterscapes project was written in Java as a Java applet uh, and other things I've made, the Wordscapes project and the, the square letters with the counters, they were made in processing. Um, I also have used more normal tools like uh, After Effects, um, and I think uh, like the N and the um, Yours animation involved some different steps. So uh, starting with a type design program called RoboFont, um, using that to then um, output paths uh, in a format that I could use then in processing, um, then taking that output, bringing it to After Effects. So it was kind of sometimes a lot of uh, different steps involved. Nice. So it's a kind of a combination, but the, the main languages you use uh, in the work you showed was were Java processing and maybe JavaScript for the web page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I did do some like C, C and C++ coding early on as well. Nice. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and uh, so Russ has a question that's related to that. Um, so he, he says, or they say, uh, it seems like you code most of these fonts or projects in C++ or, or in Java, we've found it now. Could you tell us what you think about making fonts versus making tools to make fonts? Um, and if you have to code all these yourself, uh, it seems 
like there's room for better tools basically so what yeah you yeah i definitely think so i mean i um so in some of the projects i've made where they have a um unique computational model model to make the letters um i also made like a simple tool so that making each of the letters was more visual than doing it strictly in code. Um, sometimes I've been lazy and bad at that as well. Uh, so sometimes I'll just like try to just do it on graph paper or something and then like input the numbers. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a, uh, a little bit of a back and forth uh, and figuring out what are the best ways to, to do that. I think um, these days, I, I would say a lot of type designers um, are invested and you and building tools for each other and for themselves. Um, so mm -hmm. because of how type is taught, like a lot of type designers learn Python and a lot of the tools are in Python. Um, like you, Ben Rosam and his crew, like they're all very py Python heavy. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of sharing as, as well with the different tools, which is great. Yeah, that's very nice. Um, and um, maybe adjacent to that, you just mentioned, like sometimes you'll just even sketch on paper. Um, if you make work, like how, what does the process look like for you? Do you start uh, sketching or do you like straight away write code and like sketching there? Um, is there a pattern in it or maybe not? Um, I'd say the pattern is starting on paper more often um, or iPad increasingly, but um, yeah, paper drawing with the hand I think is a helpful thing to start with uh, before jumping into code. Um, mm -hmm. I think there have been cases where I have started with code as well. So it is a little bit of a mix. Mm -hmm. But in general, I uh, so you did mention like the, the paper comes back, comes back uh, from time to time. So that's mm -hmm. also interesting to hear when uh, the work is so digital that there's a sort of a quick sketching uh, involved in the process. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really nice. Um, so uh, Yanji also had a question that is sort of tool uh, related. Um, so she or they say, um, I like this experimental funds. Do you have any idea how to bring or adapt uh, these experimental funds to a real fund file or like a, a, something that we can use in daily life? Um, yeah, I think... Uh... I would, I feel, I mean, there's variable fonts. So that's one way to um, create a usable typeface that has some different parameters of things you can play with. Um, I've spent a little bit of time on that, but haven't done a lot. Um, and I know a lot of people are trying to push that in different ways. Uh, so that's that's one avenue. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not totally sure if there's a great bridge between purely computational type and type you can use. Uh, I know, uh, I, I would say, I, I think maybe um, Talia Cotton mentioned this, is uh, a lot of branding firms will like create tools to then output uh, things that you can use like um, in as PDFs or SVGs. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's, that's another way that um, these tools can kind of bridge over. Mm -hmm. And do you have that also for, for instance, Letterscape, or is it also really meant to experience in an interactive setting? I think it's, I think I could apply it and make something different with it. I think the interactive part is the, the main reason for it, it being the way it is, as it is now, if that makes sense. Nice, yeah, that makes sense. Makes yeah, sense. even watching me play with it, I feel like is not really the ideal thing. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point, I would love to try to port these and make them available again. It's uh, on my on my list. <laughs> nice, yeah. The list you, for me usually gets longer. You know, the longer you work on. Um, for sure. But that sounds yeah. it sounds like it could be very interesting. Um. So maybe let's also talk a little bit about uh, like teaching related uh, uh work and like how you how, how you. Uh, how how that sort of affected you. So Zach asked, um, so you mentioned two prompts from John Maida. So one of, uh, that are also in Letterscape. So one to stop 
uh, thinking flat and the other one about uh, performing a letter. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about prompts in general and what prompts lead uh, to the best work. Yeah, um, I think uh, from my experience, I'm a very, I, I thrive in a learning environment. Like I, I really like, um, I like the structure of school and sort of the trying to succeed within that structure. Um, I would say I actually mm -hmm. I struggled a bit at, at UCLA uh, because mm -hmm. I feel like um, not because of the program, but I think uh, they were really trying to develop media artists. And I mm -hmm. feel like I'm a little bit more like a designer than a media artist. Uh, mm -hmm. Not that it's just a, a spectrum, but, um, you know, I, I feel like I, I, I like design prompts, problem solving um, for the most part. Uh, and media art is sort of like a odd problem. <laughs> like, how do you, like, what is the right thing to make in media art or, you know, satisfy things like Ars Electronica or like, it's kind of a, a weird space. Um, so I think I, I struggled a little bit because I didn't know how to satisfy all of the criteria or something. Um, I think, uh, you know, John was a great mentor and provided a lot of nudging and but guidance in sometimes a, like, a, like I was saying, a cryptic way. Um, and so it's kind of like also a fun puzzle to figure out how to create work that was on the right track. Um, and then the type program was very, uh, very um, like, well structured and very like okay you're gonna do this workshop you're gonna learn this skill over the weekend you're gonna learn python for coding for for type designers and another weekend you're gonna do a type um a creative workshop where you're just making things out of uh, different materials and uh coming up with new ideas that way um you're visiting the the archive you're seeing a lot of different historical models and so it's very like rich and um and well thought out and they've done it a lot so um I, I got a lot out of that too. So I don't know. I think the learning experiences are varied and often like what you make of them um, and how good a, a fit it is for you personally to the program that you're in. Mm, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's nice also to hear you talk about the, because the schools you went to and the programs you went to are so far apart in terms of what they teach you to be. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, it's really nice to hear that, okay, it's also something you can form uh, to yourself and um, maybe take you can take something from all of these things. Um, and what do you think makes, like for you, makes the best learning experience from all these mm. things that you found? I mean, I think it's a mix of clear prompts and structure and space to be creative and struggle a little bit too. So it's kind of a, a mix of the things. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so it's oh, oh it's it's one, but maybe there's time for one uh, question uh, from Steph. Um, so she or they ask, um, can you please list resources or tools a beginner should look into when they would like to start making work like this? Um, I I struggle a little bit with that question. Um, I, I I do think I think it's been mentioned, but like the coding train Dan Chipman stuff on YouTube is, I think, really good and well well, um, and and entertaining. So that might be a good place mm -hmm. to start. I think processing is a great environment and a community to check out. Mm -hmm. Nice, that's a very good one. Um, so thank you so much, Peter. Uh, the, I'm sorry we didn't get to answer all of the questions, um, but I'll uh, post Peter's website here in the chat so um, you can uh, still look at his work there. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I was so insightful. I wish we had more time to talk. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining. And I hope you all have a great day morning, afternoon, or evening, or night. Um, and yeah, this was really valuable. So I'm leaving very happy. Thank you.
one big applause for Peter when we leave. See you next.